but it's Valentine's <laughs> Day. Look at this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Four play presented by Barstool Sports. We got Shane Lowry on this show for the first time. He's fantastic. We just talked about him on the last show. Bang. Dan Rappaport, the magic man, just gets him on the show pretty much instantly. So he was awesome. We went for nearly an hour. We've got Barstool Pickleball open, which we are going to pitch and remind you that that bad boy is going live today. We've got Tiger Woods has officially unveiled the Sunday Red brand with TaylorMade Tiger Woods. A lot going on in that realm, but um let us begin oh yeah riviera myself and dan we're at riviera yesterday i've never been there before so i want to talk about riviera and the genesis but uh let's begin remind people pickleball pickleball's big if you haven't heard of it seen it played it then you've been you know under a rock as they say but barstool pickleball open we're here yeah it's massive and it's you know it's the reason that we're kind of talking about it on the golf show i know a lot of people were tweeting that at me yesterday is that it's it's intertwined if you go to any country club any golf course they're building pickleball um, facilities now and it's always been kind of like racket sports and golf has always been kind of combined um and yeah i think that this is going to be huge uh we're going to six different cities and today the registration opens and just like anything what we do at barstool if you're not really on the registration at the time that we say then you might miss out i don't know how it's going to go for pickleball i'm hoping that it goes smoothly um the long island stop last year sold out in 13 seconds 140 spots with like 550 people on the wait list within an hour or so we do have some high hopes for it but um jacksonville chicago the new england area it's actually new hampshire uh, washington dc stanford connecticut and long island those are the six stops that we're going to it's barstool-pickleball.com and uh if you're listening to this early enough if you make a pickleball den login if you go on pickleball den that's like going to be a, a fast, easy way for you to log in. Because when you go on the website, it's going to ask you to put all your name, your your partner's name, like your your address, your phone number, all that stuff. If you do that pre-registration time, noon Eastern, um, you'll already have your login ready to go and you'll be able to sign in way faster than everyone else. So that's kind of if you're listening to the podcast and you want to play in the pickleball open, um, that's kind of a, a nice tip. So. Yeah, let's go. Let's let's get this thing going. Let's get pick- the amount of people that reach out to me about this thing, like athletes and like celebrities in my DMs of being like, I want to play. There's just, uh, I mean, Dan Rapport put me in contact with this guy that just plays with every movie star in the entire world. He plays pickleball with. It's unbelievable. Like I, Matt's out of control. His Instagram. Yeah, did you did you control. talk to him? Did you talk to? Oh him? my god, dude, he's playing with like Hermione Granger. I mean, it's like his what? Oh, dude, it's Emma Watson. It's fucking. He's playing with like Thor. I mean, every single big character you could possibly think of this guy's playing pickleball with them so um we're gonna get we're getting everyone in the mix we're doing like beat a pro at a lot of these events so we're getting pros in the mix we're getting the pro teams so yeah it's gonna be very fun 12 o'clock eastern um be ready see the link be on the link yep gear up uh hopefully this bad boy sells out quickly but not too quickly if you're trying to get in and we're gonna have a lot of fun at the pickleball just like we have a lot of fun at the barstool classic Did you find any subscriptions you forgot about or any you paid for twice and did not realize it? One of our favorite apps in the history of apps. We're talking about Rocket Money, which is a personal finance app, finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. I could see all my subscriptions in one place if I see something I don't want. I cancel it with a tap. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. We love Rocket Money. This thing's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I use this thing almost every day it just connects to everything that you're doing every all the spending you're doing and it gives you a monthly report a weekly report a daily report a yearly report you've got all these different tabs that you can hit on what you want to see and it does what Riggs was talking about where it'll it'll show your subscriptions cancel the ones you don't want it's just it's a money management app all in one thing and i really do use it all the time it's huge you have no idea what's going on once you're clicking years go by so many accepting you know notifications like free trials that turn into monthly payments and you're just like oh i I gotta watch this game that's on this random streaming service i'm gonna hit it on this tv and it's attached to one phone it's attached to another email it's like that's what happened to me with amazon prime i was i was i had two fully fully bought premium packages on amazon prime for months and it's like, hey, we're going to stop this for you if you don't care. 
like say no but if you you know if you wanted to go, keep going we're going to do our job and i said yes uh rocket money has over 5 million users helped save its members an average of 720 dollars a year with over 500 million dollars in canceled subscriptions alone so stop wasting money on things you don't use cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash four that's rocketmoney.com slash four rocketmoney.com slash four speaking of a lot of fun uh tiger woods tiger woods obviously playing this week he's back really nobody's i feel like yet talking about his golf game because everybody has talked about the apparel uh sdr sunday red i was uh, of course at the event on monday evening you know it was um it was cool because tiger woods was there it was cool because it was tiger woods unveiling something new it was in a lot of ways i was talking with dan about this kind of a typical uh, media event like grab ass kind of event a lot of schmoozing going on and whatnot which is sort of what a lot of the world is uh but when tiger woods came out it was uh it was magical as it always is i had a real issue going on with my arms as i know people were clearly seeing in the comment section i just went live too early I, nobody had an itinerary uh, taylor made ceo who's a great guy incredibly sharp well-spoken was up there you know, doing an insanely long interview with Aaron Andrews, going through the entire deal, answering a lot of questions about the SDR. The people pretty quickly just wanted Tiger Woods to come out. And uh, and I was like a row back. And if I just held the phone in front of me, you would just see the back of people's heads. So I had to hold the phone up. And if you just hold your arms above your head for, I don't know, like a minute, you have, you just have to drop your arms. It's just too long. And I have... <laughs> I just got to a house of horrors and I, I thought, should I just end it? But then if you just end it and try to go back on, I don't know if you blow the whole thing. So I was sort of just in a prison of live and didn't really, didn't really know how to handle it. And eventually uh, my guy Jacques brought me up and was like, Hey, people are saying in my comment section that I'm live. You got to help Riggs out because he's somewhere back there and his arms are going to fall off. Pulled me up. I sat next to him, set the phone down. Um, and that seemed to help. But, I was pretty much trapped live on Instagram live for a long time before Tiger Woods came out. Yeah, I think you got to wait till Tiger comes out. That's it. But the problem is you don't want to miss the moment when Tiger comes out. You got to you got to you just got to have a feel for the moment. You got to be like you got to be like, "All right, this is winding down with the CEO of TaylorMade, which I'm sure was great." We thought and that then it was like, never winding down. Then the down. buzz it just starts. never it never it, that was like <laughs> it, when you were in the room Trent it was the and the other thing is we always talk about when you go live that you you got to give it a second for people to like join so i was like the whole room had sort of they had they had been the blaring music dude and they're like they turn off the music and the screen starts to change that what it's been starts to change and this video's popping and you're like this is it and i'm like i'm not gonna miss it here we go we're going live and then it was like aaron andrews and then it was some other guy and then it was like the ceo of taylor made and then it was like they talked forever and people just wanted tiger woods and i was just stuck i was just kind of stuck in that moment so yeah i went live clearly went live too early but i didn't try to go to live too early you know what i mean at least you, i mean you got roasted by and that was good yeah i you know i think um look we're not like media we're not a press conference question guys so i had a couple things on there of like what i was you know i had the, a couple of dumb ones about give me your give me your give me your top three questions that you were gonna ask Tiger Woods. I really only had a couple. I was I was gonna I was gonna ask um I was gonna say Tiger, you've you know over the years you've worn extremely baggy pants, you've worn extremely tight polos, but you haven't yet embraced this fad of joggers and hoodies on the golf course. Or we're gonna see you wearing joggers and hoodies on the golf course. And then he came out and in his pre spiel was like. We've never seen anybody wear a cashmere hoodie on the golf course, which is not, which is just not true. I was, uh, I saw that said, clip while I was legitimately <laughs> wearing a cashmere hoodie. I was wearing one <laughs> while he said so, it. Dude, so, I think, I think like if you had said, we've seen you wear like baggy pants and like, I don't even know if he like realizes these things. Like, does he know, uh, you know, I, that's like that. I'd be scared to ask that question. I'm actually glad you didn't go with that one. Cause he might be like, the fuck's this guy talking about yeah so so i kind of ditched that and then you know i was kind of like if we're, we're in this position like we're not i'm not here to get you know people are like you gotta ask him about how his game is and how he's feeling i'm like hey, have a sense of the room there it was he's gonna do a press conference wednesday today as we're recording where everyone's gonna ask him that how much you've been playing all that 
bullshit. This was all about the apparel. And then I was like, we're here to try to get, uh, I'm here to try to get a laugh. Like we're not here to get anything serious. It's a fucking apparel announcement thing. Uh, and so I went with the whole deal of trying to kind of whatever, tie it to us and credit to tiger. He roast, he turned it into a good roasting and got a good laugh out of people. So that part of it, I think went about as well as it could go. I don't know that it's like a winning situation when you're asked to do a question, his knowing smile, when you brought up be that he beat you from his knees, that's it. That's the win. And then he roasted you, got a laugh. I thought it was a, I thought it was a W. Thank you. No, I, I appreciate that. I, like I said, I don't know that you can get a ton more out of it. It's also, no matter how many times, you know, yeah, we we filmed the video with Tiger and he was great. I, it's insanely nerve wracking when they hand you the microphone and Tiger Woods just looks at you. And now you're about to speak words in front of all of these people and ask Tiger Dan Woods a question. I mean, I was, it's it's unbelievably nerve wracking. It's like your voice is quivering. You can't even, you're just like, what am I It's my first here? appearance on this show. <laughs> First appearance on the show was after that was after that little brain fart. I was so good. I and I think I said to you when we had you on that day, like if you're not brain farting in front of Tiger Woods, I had the where you station moment. Then you're not like as into Tiger Woods. Like it's like you have to when you see him and he see when he looks at you for the first time. It's you're like holy fuck, man. This yeah, is especially crazy. when he's telling you that he's gonna get his. He almost got his leg amputated. Oh, his first glance at you is always a little bit. Like he's, he doesn't give recognition immediately. He always kind of looks and stays deadpan for however long that is. And in that moment, you're going like when, if I'm dropping the thing about, you know, he famously out drove me on my knees and he never like cracks that look of a smile. Like it's the biggest disaster in history. And so finally, then when he cracks a little bit and gave that little smirk, you're like, okay. And you can loosen up a little bit. Um, but the event. The event was cool. It was very high class, like incredibly high class. Uh, they had like multiple open bars, people walking around with sushi and they're wearing like tuxedo. Like it was a hell of an event um, to be at. It was like Monday after Phoenix Open. So I was just drinking waters and trying to get through the live stream without my arms falling off. But if you had been there with like the crew on like a Friday night at this type of event, it would have been one of the coolest things I've ever been to. And then they had these, the walls uh, had like these little displays that didn't really show much when we first walked in. And then after they kind of hit the button and went live, they literally spun around and the gear was hung on the other side of them that like came around the wall. It was a fucking production, dude. I mean, it was a scene inside of this, this little event. Um, I will say too, they give you a little care package afterward, like a serious care package. So I have like a hoodie, I've got gym shorts oh. and I've got a t-shirt and then I've got gloves, a ball marker, uh a wow. couple other things and i pulled it out and the gear is fucking sick like i i don't care if people say like the hoodie i got the hoodie that tiger has that he wore when he came out of his hotel yesterday where it was just it's the black hoodie with just the big black version of the new tiger logo and it's yeah. absolutely sick so uh i'm pretty damn into the gear i love the logo i think it looks really good on the polos i like it like under the middle i thought that the back part of like Tiger was rocking yesterday, like a crew neck that had it on the back. And so was Robbie Mack at the top, sort of where the yoke is. And I thought it looked great. Um, I think some of the stuff isn't my favorite, but I think you could think about that about any apparel brand. Um, but yeah, overall, I thought there was some gear from it that I thought was extremely cool. So um, I, think yeah. it's, I think it's interesting slash cool that they're doing shoes. Um, I didn't I don't think that that was like super widely reported when it first happened. Um, and from what you were telling me yesterday, Riggs, they're not he's still like testing it. So there's a chance he might actually still wear the foot choice for a little bit in competition. But shoes is like a whole different ballgame. Shoes is a whole, is a whole separate category, um, and we've seen golf shoes take on a life of their own. Like the one that comes to mind is a Travis Scott shoe. Yeah. So there is potential for for the golf shoe to kind of be more of a cultural um, item, something that you know is stole on like stock StockX more so than like a golf hoodie is going to be. So I'm interested to see what he does with the shoe line because obviously Jordan shoes is that's where they've that's where they've made their made their money. Dan, you brought up an interesting point on Twitter that I agreed with and I hadn't thought of. Like this is a whole new thing for Tiger. Like the promotion he's going to have to do, like this event that he did with the Riggs with the unveiling and. Like with Nike, it was Tiger and Nike, and you're like, oh, yeah, Tiger wears Nike. He's an icon. It's an iconic brand. It makes sense. This, it's like starting from the ground up. Yeah. I'd never seen a video like the one that went up yesterday. Yeah. Uh, he looked like he wanted to bite the guy's head off who was filming him, but 
he obviously, you know, blessed the video and, and the, the guys uh, were filming him. It was basically an outfit of the day video. They were filming him walking to the car, you know, at, at the hotel in the morning on the way to the golf course, which Tiger is such a fiercely private person uh, historically that this is the kind of thing he would shy away from. There was a camera shooting him at 630 in the morning before he's had his coffee. You know, you'd say something. It's different now. And I think the big difference is, you know, Tiger is not a fan, I think, of, of people necessarily profiting off of him. And so with Nike, it's like, okay, if Nike's paying me X amount a year, obviously it's an enormous number, but if they're paying him $15 million a year, doesn't really, doesn't really change whether he, whether he goes and does an Instagram post. Like that number is set now. Right. It's his business. So he is in the, in the, he has a vested interest in promoting this, in building all the followers on the social media accounts and building the awareness. And so I think we're going to see a lot more of Tiger Woods doing these kind of promotional things than we've ever seen before, because this is his new chapter. This is a thing that I think he's looking at as, okay, Michael Jordan, part of the reason Michael Jordan is such an icon is because of what he did with Jordan Brand after he was playing. Tiger is 48 years old now. I saw that number and I couldn't believe it. He's 48 years old. He's, he's staring at, you know, potentially his playing days being numbered. This is what's gonna gonna take him into into hopefully you know a new chapter. And I think he's diving head first. I mean, his Rolex post yesterday. I know he's always had Rolexes on the wrist, but like that, yeah, I've that never was seen different too. So like, just time to go. Here's my Rolex, and here's my Tiger Woods wrist. That was so weird. Like I don't like it was just weird. You know, here's like, my I don't Tiger even, Woods wrist. I don't like to see like. Like yeah, I've never seen his like wrist hair like that. Like it's just, it was so it was we so. Gonna, just... Is he gonna start doing TikToks? Like what you know? What's where? <laughs> where do we go with this thing? There is something to like. You got to keep him, Tiger Woods, in the mystique. Like up, you can't you can't dive too deep into this new world of like promoting everything. You can't. You can't, and it might be the type of thing where he's such a iconic figure that this stuff. I'm sure this stuff is gonna do well. Um, I actually, I agree with Riggs. I like the stuff that I saw. I think it's going to do really well. So maybe you can keep, it's not as much promotion as it would be if it were somebody else, but he's definitely going to have to do more. And he's already done more videos the last two days than I thought he, than he's done in like the last five years. Uh, this is a conversation that we've had before, right? Of like Tiger Woods versus Michael Jordan. And we have talked about how like he just didn't cash in. Like the, the Tiger Woods golf shoes should be the only golf shoes that anyone wears in the world and the tiger woods logo and you know the jump man versus the tiger woods logo and the tiger woods brand on apparel and yeah nike golf had a thing and everybody kind of went through a phase i bought plenty of nike golf polos but it, it if you look now it's like nike golf when tiger was there wasn't this incredibly like iconic brand that you had to have in terms of just nike golf nike's nike but if you were a golfer you didn't like have to have it in the way that you had to have Jordans and all that and you know Dan and I were talking about if you look at Jack Nicholas and Arnold Palmer and how and even Jordan like how rich they became they became some of the top, I believe they're all three three of the top five richest athletes in the history of the world like those earnings came after they played for the most part yes they made a good amount when they played but their brands like they lasted they had that longevity where they got bigger and bigger and made killings in their later later years and i think that this is a big part of tiger trying to to do that and trying to lean into that which is something that we've kind of said you know that that we're surprised hadn't happened before and i think like if he is later into his career like if he's not out there playing you know golf which is what we love to do and we talk with shane lowry about this coming up about how certain people who it's like dude you're not your job isn't to be managing you know organization or trying to figure out the best way to partner with this group like your job is to play golf well if tiger woods gets to a point where he's clearly getting closer to that where his job is not to like play golf as much as it was or even at all coming up then like he's got to keep his brain busy that's how he fucking is it's how he rolls and i think he probably sees that and is like look like i'm gonna try to get out of this and uh, and not work something like the nike deal where like dan and i said again that I think he does despise when people are just profiting off of him, but instead to do something that, you know, could potentially last for a really, really long time, turn into a massive apparel brand, logo brand, shoes, the whole deal. Uh, I, I think it's probably a pretty good move. Now, whether they pull it off and absolutely, you know, crush it, turn it into the biggest thing, that takes a lot of things to go right, takes a little bit of luck, whatever it might be. But I think he is kind of doing something that we talked for years about 
it being crazy that he wasn't able to do before. First athlete, Charlie Woods. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Like, do they sign other guys? Because you got Tiger, so you don't Good necessarily one. need other guys right. to sell Old the Tiger. brand. But it does, yeah, I would be surprised if Charlie wasn't wearing Sunday red. But yeah, I don't know. Like, JT's the first one that comes to mind because he plays with, I mean, it's it's actually kind of silly. They're playing again this week. He plays with JT every single time he plays in the PJ Tour. It's out of control. He just says, I respect it. It's like, you know what? If I'm playing golf, I'm playing with the kid. I'm playing with my boy. It's every time. It is also funny that he only plays five times a year or whatever it is. And like the first two are events that are his events. So it's the hero and he like he just gets to pick. And then, you know, the Masters, the he's like the kid. Yeah, that's right. PNC does just play pretty much with who um with JT. Who's on the bag? Do we know, Dev? I missed it or who's been? Yeah, out there? it's this guy, Lance Bennett, who apparently, you know, he's, he's a guy who's been on a lot of bags. He was on um, Matt Kuchar's bag. He was on Bill Haas's bag, Lorena Ochoa, just like a veteran caddy who was actually caddying most recently for Adrian Dumont de Chassard, who you guys remember from the NV5 Invitational, the Belgian guy. Yep. Um, but Adrian's not in this event, so he's playing. But yeah, it's uh, you guys were right. He, he didn't go with Rob. He wants like an experienced tour caddy. Lance Bennett just doesn't seem like a Tiger Woods uh, guy, but just the name. I'm sure he's a great guy, great caddy. Lance Bennett. You're not a fan. Just that name. Just like well, it hits me with like a. It just hits me with like a. I don't know. Like a like a, a little, sharp little, sword. A little in sync going on. Lance is Lance is an interesting name. Lance Armstrong. Yeah. Why do I picture a person in like full night gear? Like, um, like with a K. Like, you know. Oh, like, night gear. Oh. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Knight in shining Lansing. armor. Oh, Sir Lance a lot. That's right. Okay. That's why. First thing, whenever I think of Lance Bennett, I, I just hear clank, like clanking and like, you know, a full fucking <laughs> knighted outfit. I don't know why. It's just I can't get out of my head. So uh, maybe night. we dress him up like that, and then Tiger walks up the eighteenth, the you know, the seventy second hole at Augusta <laughs> National with a with a knight behind him and a sword and just fucking <laughs> uh, Lance Bennett. Lance Bennett. Yeah, I, you know, I I don't know that he's going to be as prominent as uh, Joey Lacava or Stevie Williams, but is Lance Bennett? That's just but he will be expected to be. That's what's crazy is like you just named two of Tiger's like three caddies of his life. Like, yeah, he's going to be pretty fucking used and prominent. He's Lance Bennett. He's here for the final chapter of Tiger Woods' golf career. It's fucking nuts. Like Tiger Woods' final potential round ever, if he ever wins again, will be with Lance Bennett. And this is no disrespect to Lance Bennett. I just it's a shocking name to me, right? That's pretty fucking prominent. If 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 the last guy to ever shake Tiger with his hands in a professional tournament is Lance Bennett, wow, it is. But I I also like I don't know. Um, the there's only a few like notable notable caddy names I think that would pop that would like on that level. I think Ti- like Tiger made. I mean Joe Lacava was named, but I don't know that you were walking around or I was walking around before 2010. Knowing like a household name, Joe LaCava, I think like that makes it Tiger then yeah. elevates him. And I think, what was he going to get? J- like Bones from JT? No. Was he going to get Greller? From he's Steve? Tiger Woods. So no. I don't know. So I, maybe, I don't know. Dude, I don't Bones know that should just like, double bag it. They play together every time. You should just, <laughs> you should just idea, do dude. both. That's a great like, idea. Like you're saying that like it's a, like out of out of this realm, but it's like, yeah, me like these Tiger Woods, you get anyone. He can get anyone. In the, he's Tiger Woods. Like he could get. We're talking about. I think we did kind of. I don't remember who said it. I don't even know if it was me or if it was one of you guys. But it, we did think he was going to get an experienced caddy, and that's what he got. Lance Bennett. Yeah, he got one. He got one. He got one. Lance Bennett. Yeah, maybe he. Maybe in you know a couple of years, it's like wow, Lance Bennett was there for the twenty twenty four Masters, and it's like look at this iconic photo of Lance Bennett and Tiger. Like I, I'm yeah. in on it. I'm all in on Lance Bennett. It's just <laughs> it was shocking. Like I don't. The, the Tiger Woods just like the name's his, tripping his, you up. You don't like the name. I don't I hate the name, but it's just like Tiger <laughs> Woods, I don't know. His his story, his movie like like life, I expected a Stevie Williams return or like you know what I mean? Like something that really was like, all right, this is how it ends. Like this is it. Like I, I don't know. Just Lance Bennett was like, whoa. <laughs> you know? I guess whoa. we'll see. <laughs> whoa. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, I don't know a ton about him either. So who knows? Who knows that? I'm sure. I'm like, gonna, I mean, if you don't think I'm going to be sucking Lance Bennett off the next tournament, we go to the Tiger Woods is playing, and you're insane. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna be talking Islanders Rangers to Lance Bennett tomorrow. So he's like, I don't even watch hockey. Why are you talking so much Islanders Rangers <laughs> yeah. to me, dude? We're gonna go back in like eight months, and we're gonna replay this audio after Lance Bennett just got us to like run into the fairway and talk. To, I mean, Lance Bennett might be the like a huge foreplay guy. We have no idea. We don't know. We have no. We have no recon on Lance Bennett. Maybe he's got kids that are all huge foreplay guys. They play in the Barso Classic or something. We know nothing about this guy. So yeah, maybe I am talking a little too much before I actually do my homework. Any idea where he's from, Dan? No, no clue. I, I don't. Yeah. I don't know anything about him really. Yeah, I kind of like that he's a little mysterious. Yeah, you know, he's a two name guy though. I don't think you know. No one's calling him. I think he's Lance Bennett. I don't. You know, he's he's a two name guy. He is a two name guy. <laughs> nothing is. wrong with that. <laughs> nothing wrong with you know two name guys. Yeah, that, yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, there's Trent Ryan is a two name guy. So you're Michael right. Jordan. Yeah. He's he's pretty good. <laughs> yes. Michael Scott, iconic. We got a three name guy at uh, Barstool Sports. Jeff D. Lowe. I don't yeah. know if it's three names. I mean, I'm a three name like, guy technically. Oh, three. You're talking about what you say. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah, nobody calls it. me I Trent can... Ryan. Oddly, at at Barstool, I'm a two name guy. Never in my life. I've never been that. But Dave never called me just Frankie. It was always Frankie Borelli. I mean, in the office, he would like just to me. But like on video, it was always just Frankie Borelli. I always found that to be very. That was like the first time in my life that ever happened. You got a good name. It's like it, it flows. Frankie Borelli. A lot of people call me Bronzy in my DMs and in, on go. comments. I put up a couple pictures yesterday promoting <laughs> the, the, the pickleball thing. A lot of Bronzo, Bronzy, Bronze. I'll be there, Bronzy. I, lo- <laughs> I was just laughing. It's like if that's going to become a thing, that's hilarious. <laughs> You're rooting for it. Yeah, you I are. am. It's cool. Yeah. It's cool. Was, I'll get um... a ta- I'm going to get a tan this year, too. So oh, we'll, we'll see. see. Now that we'll see. May in uh, Ireland, I don't think you're going to get it. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, how's uh, How's Riviera Riggs? Riviera is really cool. I, I would say I think Riviera is a was a top five like bucket list course for me, just because it it gets rave reviews from everybody on tour. They're bringing the U.S. Open there. Uh, I had the U.S. Amateur there when our friend Doug Gim lost in the final to Doc Redman, uh, and it's just sort of a, a iconic course that's that's not. That doesn't have, um, you know, dominant feature that makes it iconic. It's not on the ocean. It's not in the mountains. It's not right. It's just sort of in L.A. And boy, is it. It's it's spectacular. Every hole just is incredibly uh, unique. I was telling Dan yesterday, like when you walk onto a place that's kind of famous and you see it for the first time in person, how cool that is. And Riviera is one of those, like seeing the clubhouse, seeing the view down the first tee. That's where Tiger Woods hit his first ever uh, professional golf tournament shot when he played in the PGA Tour. And he was like 16 years old or whatever he was. So like seeing that in person and then looking to the right and seeing the 18th green with the hill around it and then looking just left and seeing the iconic 10th hole. That's the you know best short par four in, in the world and just seeing all of it right there in real time was super super cool and then we went straight down found tiger woods on like the 12th hole in the first experience i had at riviera we just walked with tiger woods uh on the back nine at um at riviera so it's it's spectacular the clubhouse is quite something the homes that are all around it are quite something i didn't know that like the pif owns this like 80 million dollar home on top of the bluff that dan was pointing out that that's where like the original meeting was four or five years ago and you're just looking around like you're clearly surrounded by a hilarious amount of money in this part of the world, part of the United States, part of uh, Los Angeles. Uh, so all of that kind of adds to it. And um, and then Tiger Woods walking with Tiger. Uh, he looked really solid. I thought he was driving the ball great. I thought his irons looked fine. I thought his short game looked a little bit uh, rusty, but it's hard to tell. He's out there by himself. He's chipping to different pin locations and putting to different holes the mo on him as uh i think it was our friend bob herrick that i was talking to was that because you know tigers never won at riviera even though it's one of the courses that he plays all the time pretty much any course that he plays all the time he's got like eight wins at uh bay hill tory pines all those he wins a million times uh was that he's always been mystified by the greens and so uh i was just trying to watch him pretty closely out there looked like he had the greens figured out to me but what that means when they go out and play on thursday uh, who the hell knows? This is like a weird, really weird cut event where there's only 70 players, but 
the top 50 make the cut, which I didn't even know that was a thing. But, you know, I think it's because Tiger's always been a proponent that you can't really have no cut events. And so he doesn't want his event to be a no cut event, but he wants it to be a limited field. So you got 70 players playing for 50 spots at the cut. It'd be a real, real like silly situation if Tiger is one of the few players that misses the cut at his own event. There is, all, a, yeah, there's cut. a chance that there's like four. I mean, it's top 50 and ties. And <laughs> if you're within 10 shots of the lead, you're also making the weekend. So there's a chance that there's like four guys who missed the cut, which oh. would be just, it's not going to be like this next year. I think everyone kind of realized there's only 70 guys in the field. It's kind of a fakakta situation this year. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of rooting for something really bizarre to happen this year where it's like, remember that year when, when 65 guys made the cut and four missed it. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, he was moving, moving solidly. You know, he, uh, he, he still labors on the leg a little bit, but it's not in any way a, like a um, exaggerated, like limp as we've seen before. So I, I think he's moving just as well as we saw him moving toward the end of the year uh, last year. He, he doesn't move as quickly as he moved when he shot our video. Uh, cause I've never seen him that excited before, but he was taking his time, you know, again, he was playing alone out there and he drove the ball extremely well, which I think has always been a, a huge thing for Tiger. Cause he's perhaps the greatest iron player of all time. He's clearly got great touch. So that stuff will come around if it's not there already. If he's driving the ball well and, and pretty far, which it looked like he was moving it, um, hitting it fucking hard. Uh, he could be a real force. So, uh, it was hard to tell in like a Tuesday practice round in the morning he was out there by himself showcasing his new gear. But I thought he looked pretty damn good. What'd you think, Dan? Yeah, he looks solid. I mean, I I saw a uh, I think it was on DraftKings Sportsbook. Obviously, uh, odds to make the cut were only like minus one fifty, which I thought was kind of insane given the cut rules. Um, he played he played well here last year. I remember he shot two under the first round. Uh, he was playing with JT and Rory. It was awesome, and he he made the cut on the number. He shot four under in the on Saturday. And it was like, holy shit, is this guy going to fucking win another golf tournament pretty soon? Uh, and didn't look as good on Sunday. So I'm expecting a solid showing. I'm excited to see the presser today because I think today will, be, today will be a lot more about the golf. It'll be a lot more about what he expects from himself moving forward, whether he thinks that he can still play once a month. Um, but I'm just excited to watch Tiger play in front of people, uh, you know, a couple miles from my house. This is just like my favorite week of the year. So I'm really looking forward to getting out there. Let's go Tiger Woods, baby. Let's go Tiger Woods. Uh, Let's go Tiger right. Woods is right. Let's go Tiger Woods. He's playing golf. Uh, I can't fucking wait. Okay. Shane Lowry. We got a great interview with Shane Lowry. He's telling Rory stories, Ryder Cup stories. Uh, we have a very funny moment in the middle of the interview uh, where he got a package. So awesome, awesome chat with Shane Lowry. Make sure that you're ready to go sign up for the Barstool Pickleball Open. It goes live at noon Eastern Standard Time today. That's Thursday, February 15th, 2024. So will be ready to rock for that. Otherwise, we'll be back uh, Tuesday next week, as we always are. Hit it hard. Hit it hard. Hit it hard. Hit it hard. Tiger Woods, we talk about him. He's out there on the golf course this week playing for the first time in 2024, and he is using the QI-10 from TaylorMade Golf. TaylorMade had just a few weeks ago at the beginning of this year all three of their new QI-10 drivers won on different professional golf leagues in a two-week span. We had the QI-10 Max, the QI-10, and the QI-10 uh, LS, which is the low spin, all won. Nelly Corda uh, won. Tommy Fleetwood won. Roy McIlroy's out there winning. Scotty Sheffield. All these guys are out there winning, and girls that are using the new QI-10. Tiger Woods is using the QI-10. I watched him. Drive the golf ball like an absolute madman at Riviera on the back nine, just driving it far, straight, hitting it where he wants to. We love the new QI-10, 10K inertia, most forgiving club uh, on the driver's standpoint that TaylorMade has ever released, and it has dramatically changed my game already, which I'm very thankful for. Yeah, we played in the Good Good Desert Open, and it was my first time hitting a driver in, what f in legitimately almost two months, and that's a very unnerving feeling and you're very very um, worried about where the ball is going to be hit on this on the club face because you really haven't we didn't have a driving range we didn't get to do anything so it was my first time making contact with this thing on a 280 yard par four a very <laughs> drivable par four and i was just like i'm just gonna trust this golf club i i know it i know that it's gonna be very forgiving 
and I smacked one off the toe and it went dead straight, ended up going into the greenside bunker. Like that was like basically right in the middle of our view from the tee box. And I just, I looked at Trent. I'm like, this golf club is, it's a cheat code. Like with anything else, even years ago, just like any other club, I would have been a little bit more nervous, but something about that we know all the facts about this. They taught us it uh, uh, when we went to the TaylorMade Day. We saw all the videos. We hit this club a million times. We know that this thing makes a difference. I've been I've been the biggest advocate for this driver more than any other driver that we've pushed because it's just that much different. And I know we push one every single year. I get it. Stealth one, stealth two. The whole this is this one. This one's a di- this one's different. It really is. It truly, truly is. It's made with 10K MOI for maximum stability and forgiveness at impact. That is what makes that difference. You can hit it on the toe off the heel. It just makes a big difference. It still goes straight. It still goes about the same distance. So shop the QI10 Max, the QI10, and the QI10 LS drivers, plus schedule a custom fitting at TaylorMadeGolf.com. That is TaylorMadeGolf.com. And go check out the new QI10 series drivers from TaylorMade. All right, folks, we're joined on the podcast for the very first time, 2019 Open champion, member of the winning Ryder Cup team on the European side. Last year, I think a fan favorite. I have to imagine one of the people's golfers over in Europe, although we do not live in Europe. Shane Lowry, welcome to the show. My first question, you know, you kind of, you got to rate Dan's caddying performance for me. Oh, <laughs> um, I was actually just out at the Dive Preserve yesterday and somebody was talking to me about it. He was okay. I, if I was really stuck, I might have him for a week. But it was it was blowing forty, and you shot two under without a bogey. So I thought things went pretty well. I don't you know I don't know. Maybe you have higher standards than I thought, but courses, yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe it was okay. Okay is not great, Dan. So you might have to work on your caddying skills. Uh, Dan just kind of mentioned that you were uh, mingling maybe in our comment section recently. I know you've been in Justin Thomas's comments over the last several months. What were you? What went on in our comment section? Because I missed it as well. Well, you guys were talking about the waste management and obviously what went on there over the weekend. And I think you got to mention it that people have like short memories. And I think what went on at the weekend just goes on every year the waste management. And I think the golfers know that if they don't want to deal with the heckling or the crowd or the kind of not the mess that it is, but it is what it is. And I think it's uh, it's one of those tournaments that. One, once a year is pretty cool um any more would be tough but uh yeah I, I quite enjoyed last week i know the weather was the only bad part for me i think the rest of it was pretty cool i think obviously the weather wasn't great because it's a stadium course and and the banks were all full of mud and water and, and people couldn't stand there so that's why it was probably a little bit busier everywhere else and there was a bit of carnage everywhere else. Yeah, so your takeaway is that it was pretty similar to other years where maybe the weather was a little different, but in terms of the partying and the heckling or whatever you want to call it that goes on, you thought it was pretty standard for a waste management tournament? Yeah, I, I remember my first uh, my first waste management, I think it was like 2016 or something like that. Around then, uh, I was in the final group on Saturday and honestly, I've never seen anything like it in my whole life. It was like, the craziest thing I've ever seen on the course. Uh, you know, a guy ran across the 17th green we were playing and did a bomb into the lake. Uh, a few things like that happened throughout the day. And it's like, you know, that's kind of what you've come to expect with the waste management. And I think, you know, if we tried to take away from that, I think it might be a bad idea. How do you, you've played a few Ryder Cups. So you've been around rowdy fans. How do rowdy American fans differ from rowdy European fans? I think, well, especially Irish people, I think us Irish people get a bad name for being, like, big drinkers. <laughs> and I think when you go to PGA Tour events, especially the waste management, uh, I mean, I see people last week, like, I, look, I've I've been known to have a few drinks in my time and I've been pretty drunk before, but I've never been that bad where I can't actually stand up. And you see people at the waste management where they actually can't walk out after the day's golf. And I think that's just crazy. You see people get getting carried out by their or friends and yeah it's uh obviously there's loads of those videos that go viral where guys can barely walk and i just think it's a bit it's a bit mad you say that but I, it looks like do you have 15 bottles of jameson behind your head right now yeah they're all full though so it's <laughs> 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 they're on. that's like a display that's my bar yeah so i do have a little rider cup there as well just in case the americans don't know oh, mm-hmm. okay. there, 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 there. there we go 
Everything was going nice. nice and smooth, and then you had to bring oh. that up. I was going to say, it'd be tough for Shane Lowry to not like the rowdy, like fun atmosphere. I feel like this. Do you feel like because of just your personality and I don't know, just like the, the Irish culture, it's just like people kind of gravitate towards you to like have a party around you? Yeah, and that, that's actually one of the hard parts. But don't get me wrong, it, it is quite like, uh, like the week I played okay for most of the week last week. And, and when you're playing okay and doing well, it, it's pretty easy and you know it's enjoyable or whatever but then i had a bad sunday and you know you're having a bit of a bad day and people are getting on top of you it does get tough but like you know you, you know before you go to the event what it's going to be like so if you don't want to if you don't want to deal with it you know just don't play like you could play in you know other weeks so uh yeah but i do get it where people think that i'm gonna go over and have a drink with them mid-round that's what people <laughs> think to me and i'm like no I, i'm actually playing a golf tournament here we had so. this conversation we had this conversation at die preserve because i had heard all these wild stories about you and the celebration after winning the british open in 2019 and you were like none of those stories are true i don't know how people I heard some story that you were stumbling down the streets of Dublin and you fell face first and you're like, I don't know where people come up with this. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, no, some stories might be true, but most of them are uh, fabricated. But uh, yeah, it's a bit like we talked about on the last podcast where the, with the waste management, it feels like that event has to live up to like every year. It's like, all right, this is the waste management. So we need people who are can't walk, like don't know, like can't handle gravity right now. Their friends are carrying them out. And I feel like Irish people go through a similar thing where it's like, you're Irish. Oh, all right. So you're going to have to drink more than everybody. And it's just like, largely, it's not that true. Yeah, no, like, it's not. But yeah, waste management does actually live up to And I think people go to the waste management and they go with the sole purpose of just getting as drunk as they can and having a great time. And, it, you know, if I people ask me what it's like, and I'm like, it's like a big music festival, but there's just a golf tournament going on in the middle of it. Um, and that's what it feels like to me. So, um, yeah, people certainly enjoy themselves there. What's uh what's your favorite stop on tour? I mean, obviously we've talked about the Phoenix Open and you gotta embrace it. Some people do, some people don't. I don't know that Phoenix Open is that many guys' favorite stop, but a lot of guys, you know, can lean into it, some can't. What's your what's your favorite stop because of the course or the treatment or the fans or whatever? I like going West Coast. I, I haven't been this is my first year on West Coast, like San Diego, I think is a great week. Uh I love it down there in Torrey Pines in La Jolla. Um yeah, there's certain tournaments that I just love playing, like the Memorial. I love the golf course. I like Dublin, Ohio. It's a pretty cool place. Nice place to hang out. Um, Hilton Head's probably one of my favorites. Hilton Head is my favorite, yeah. that's. Okay. I think the week after the Masters, uh, the Masters is the most stressful week of the year. And then Hilton Head, it feels like the most chill week of the year. So it's it's nice to go there afterwards and kind of chill out. What makes the Masters the most stressful? I mean, I know it's the Masters, but I feel like you, you know, you guys, especially you as a, uh, open champion you guys hold the open uh pretty high the u.s open is the toughest what makes the masters is that much more stressful i think there's like such a build-up to it it's like you know obviously the open finishes in july and then the next major is not till uh, april and there's a big build-up to the masters i think the golf course uh is a very stressful course to play because you know you're only one shot away from a disaster all the time no matter what hole it is and it's you know you need to be really on your game and um yeah I, i've played pretty i played okay there the last couple of years and you know by the end of the week you're just absolutely wrecked from um the kind of mental stress of the whole thing so uh that's yeah i would say it's it's probably more stressful than than the open um you know and people obviously it's a toss-up between what people want to win and it probably depends where you're from uh, whether it's the open or the masters um but yeah, I think people want to win it so badly that it's it, it it's up there with the most stressful one. This this is the first year I can remember where where you're not in this week. Uh, you're not in the Riviera event. Did you ask Tiger for an exemption? You couldn't you couldn't get your boy T Dub to to throw I, you a bone. I did. I've asked for a lot of exemptions and not got many. So um, yeah, I it's it's strange. It's it's funny. It's um, you know uh, Pebble Beach was probably the first tournament in a long... I think since the Masters 2017 or 2018, 2018 maybe, since I've not been in a tournament that I really wanted to be in. Um, so, yeah, it's strange sitting at home and it's it's kind of not hard, but sitting at home watching the, the boys play a big event is, is tough, but... Uh, you know that's that's my own fault. I should have played better last year. And but that it's an interesting time for this to happen because obviously with like all the live stuff, like you know, it's it's easy to say, oh, I want to be here, I want to earn it when you're playing well, right? And you're in all these tournaments. Now I would imagine you're like, shit, man, maybe 
you know, should I have, should I have taken this, this easy road out? No, I, I never, I never did. I, 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 I'm like, after this week, I, I hope to be like, I'm sponsored by MasterCard. So I'd hope to get an invite for Bay Hill, uh, if I'm lucky. And then hopefully I can play my way into the other events. You know, uh, we've got Hilton Head, uh, Memorial, what we've got, Travelers. Fargo, Travelers. So by then I'd hope to play my way into them, get back in the top 30 in the world or play my way in somehow. But, uh, yeah, th- like, like I said, I probably should have, pl- I should have played better last year, but you know, it is what it is now. I'm not in the tournament. And to be honest, yes, I'd love to be in the tournament, but for me, I'm trying to build my schedule towards April. And that's, I think that's what players do. And, um, if anything, I probably played a little bit too much this time of year last year. So, uh, hopefully it's going to make a bit of a difference when it comes to Saturday and Sunday at Augusta. When you ask Tiger Woods for an exemption, how does that process go? Are you crafting like a text message? Do you call him? How does that go? I wrote letters uh, pretty much to to all the tournament. I didn't write one to Tiger Woods himself. I just wrote it to the tournament, the tournament director and his people, I suppose. So, look, I, I can't argue with the invites this week. When you look at them, it's, you know, it's pretty, it's okay. But yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to think and I'd like to hope that with how supportive I've been of the tour over the last couple of years, that I've managed to get one or two invites this year. That's that's how I feel about it. I'm disappointed not to get one of the first two, like Pebble Beach or this week, but it is what it is. I can't do about it. Do you write that email like you know how we write cold emails, where you're like, uh, "I hope this email finds you well." You know, do you, do you start it with like a pleasantry, you're like, "Hey, I'm Shane. My name is Shane Lowry. I'm a professional golfer." Like, what do you even say? You just tell them uh, how much you want to play the tournament. Pretty much tell them. <laughs> Yeah, how great your tournament is and how much you actually want to play in it and uh yeah. Like, you know, Pebble Beach and I've never I've not I've played it a few times, but I've not played it that much over the years, so um but I was hopeful of that one, but obviously I didn't get it. Is it an email or is it a handwritten letter? Some email, some handwritten, like I've handwritten one to Jack for a memorial. Um I know Jack personally from down here because I'm a member at his golf club, so uh yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, some people some handwritten ones, some emails. You're like, uh, you're nice like Google in the, the history of the events, and you're like, you know, I'll never forget. Yeah. When so, <laughs> I would love to be in that spot. Uh, that's, that's try to write as much cool. stuff on that as I can. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the the Ryder Cup. I mean, you were uh, in at Whistling Straits, which we were at. You were, you know, obviously it didn't go. Uh, your guys' way, but you were riled up. You had an incredible moment. I think it was Saturday on the 18th green where I've never seen you go that crazy before. A couple of years later in Europe, in Rome, um, you guys are leading, you're dominating. Walk me through everything on Saturday night on the 18th green with the hat gate from your perspective because we've all seen it. It kind of turned for our vantage point what was kind of a sleepy Ryder Cup as USA guys, you're up, you guys are kind of kicking our asses to like a little bit of a fire. There was a little bit of controversy. Um, Joe with Cava, who's a friend of our program, is yelling at Rory, he's yelling back and forth with you at some point. From your perspective, how did that whole thing go down? Yeah, obviously, um, I mean, we were winning pretty good and, and we were all thinking if we could win, if Rory and, Rory and Fitzy could win their match, that it was pretty much over. Um you know, I think if they had won their match, it would have been eleven and a half, four and a half, I think, uh, which obviously would have been a big, big lead to lose, um, and we would have made a history on Sunday regardless if we had a won or lost. But <laughs> um, one up with three to play, and they end up obviously uh, Patrick Birdie seventeen to go back all square, and then he he hit a bad chip on the last, and then we're thinking, well, we might be able to sneak this again, and and he obviously hold that putt. I'm standing at the back of the green, we're obviously disappointed that he hold that putt. Um. Then obviously, obviously Patrick was getting a lot of stick throughout the day off the fans, uh, with Hackgate and all that, and uh, Joe Lacava kind of got in on it as well. And what what kind of got me going was Joe. We were standing at the back of the green, and he walked back over to John Wyndham Clark's caddy, and he was after waving his hat. And then he, as Rory was reading his book, he kind of went back towards Rory, which. I thought it was kind of our line, and then that's when I was kind of I got on the green. And I was like telling Joe to basically few weeks later, was put to get out of the way, and he he turned around and started shouting at me, and uh, then Rory and Fitzy missed their putt, and then you know we had not words, but I kind of said how much I didn't like it afterwards, uh, and then we were 
to be honest, I think um, I think if anything, it helped us. Uh, it fired us up um, because from the position we were in, it would be easy to be a little bit complacent going into Sunday. Uh, and it made us just realise how much we actually want to win. And I think uh, we went into the locker room that Saturday evening, and and uh, yeah, we were we were fired up. I remember then we were out. Rory and I decided to get a car back together, and uh, then the first person he seen was Bones. <laughs> And uh, he, uh, yeah, he said a few things to Bones, and we got in the car and we're on the way back. And I'm kind of on my phone, and and we're about 15 minutes into the journey. And I said to Rory, "Oh my God, Rory, there was cameras outside the clubhouse." There. Like, <laughs> you gotta know there's cameras, dude. Yeah. It's the Ryder Cup. There's cameras I'm, everywhere. I'm, we're looking at the video, and and to be honest, R- Rory's wife Erica did an unbelievable job on the way back, like trying to calm him down because uh, he was very fired up. Um, and then we get back to the hotel and the first person he sees is Ricky Elliott who carries for Brooks. Then he has a go at Ricky and I'm like, Rory, would you just get into the team room, man? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was all, look, we, we you know, obviously we, we had a Sunday night party and we all met there. You know, it's kind of water under the bridge. But um, yeah, it, it did. It probably, if anything, it made it exciting and it made a bit of a story going into Sunday. So that was yeah, that was pretty good. Yeah, I mean, we we loved it, but when we finally then saw the side video of Joey Lacava, like it was crazier than we thought in real time to go back out on the green. I've never seen anybody do anything like that. Yeah, it looked like he was going to hit him. It looked like he was going to hit him. There was a moment there was like, is he going to hit Rory McIlroy? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'd say Joey could be a bit scary as well. Like, it was, you know, I wouldn't want to wouldn't want to go there. But it was, yeah, it was one of those where, uh, yeah, when you. When you see the video back, it wasn't great, but I'm sure, like, look, it is what it is, and he was just sticking up for his player, and we were sticking up for our players. I mean, you know what it is? Like, when your team's getting kind of trounced like that in any, like, team sport, uh, you know, jo- Joey's a huge hockey guy. You go out there, you get into a fight, and you, you get the locker room going, you get the bench going. Like, I'm sure he had sort of that mentality where it's like, I got to get these guys going somehow one way or another. It just doesn't translate to golf very well. It's like, yeah, it's, you're it's, out there waving a hat. You're doing something. It's like, all right, what yeah. are we going to have a fist fight on the green? It's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. And then like, you know, uh, I'm sure if other sports look at it, like waving a hat is if that's the worst thing you can do, I think. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you shoving Rory into the car is like one of my favorite videos like, of all time. <laughs> Just like get him in the car. What, the last like 18 months for Rory, and obviously you guys are close. What has been your vantage point on all that? Because it's obviously been, I guess, a tumultuous time would be the best way to describe it. What has been your sort of view of everything that's gone on with him? Yeah, I mean, uh, like off the course with everything that's going on with PGA Tour, I think he's done a great job. And like, you know, he was the first person, one, you know, he was first and probably one of the only people to come out and really back the tour and, you know, get their side. And a lot, I think a lot of guys stayed quiet throughout the whole process, which is obviously fair enough. They didn't want to voice their opinion. But look, I think Rory did a good job. But I do think, and I did say it to him a few times uh, throughout the past year, I'm like, Rory, you just, you know, I, I kind of not encouraged him, but I said it to him about being on the board and doing all that and, you know, all, the, all that stuff that's going on away from the course. I'm like, Rory, all you care about is winning majors, man. Just, just go and concentrate on your golf and focus on yourself and everything else will take care of itself you know it's uh it's what he wanted to do and obviously he's changed his tune a little bit over the last while um but i think he's just probably probably a little bit uh, i have, haven't actually spoken to him in the last few weeks because i've been we've been playing different schedules of just a, the odd text here and there but you know i'd say he's probably a little bit annoyed that people are have not kind of people have turned their back on him certain players have turned their not back on him but the obviously difference of opinions and um, you know, he's a bit maybe annoyed with that and I think he's just like I said, he's just worrying about himself now and the only thing that matters from him here now is, is the f- second week in April, I think, and uh he should just focus on that and focus on winning winning more majors. So so between the Ryder Cup and between what you were just saying, it paints a picture of a guy who just kinda like feels things really hard and almost like can't help himself. Is that a fair is that a fair description of, of Rory where he just cares a lot about a lot of things which is not a not a bad thing at all but you know we all know certain people in our lives who just they're the guy who if something's happening when you're out at the bar they're the ones who's going to go over and say something or they're the ones who are going to sort of handle the situation yeah I, I think look Rory's obviously a very uh confident uh clever person and he just um shit sorry guys I just got uh 
I got a package. You will have to leave. <laughs> no, I can't even do it. Oh my god! What? Do you want to see what it is? Yeah, yeah. This is like. What could we have any guests? It's gonna be I like don't know. A human is it being a, or something? The way he reacted, it was like it's an elephant or something. <laughs> <laughs> I see something huge and pink in the background. Oh, it's Valentine's Day today. Ah, oh, it is Valentine's <laughs> Day. Look at this guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know the worst thing is people, what? Are, people are gonna actually think that that was like oh my god i'm gonna kill her i'm gonna see her yeah happy valentine's day shane happy valentine's day guys <laughs> happy valentine's That's day unbelievable. <laughs> is That's that from awful. your is that from the missus or what is that she uh, yeah it's from my wife he never does anything like that that's so weird <laughs> anyways <laughs> What are we talking have about? Na- does that have your name on it? <laughs> Has my name yeah. on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was perfect. You the the balloon just sort of floated into it. frame for a second. It, <laughs> it said Shane on the on the heart, <laughs> and it was beautiful. Uh, <laughs> oh. Are you embar- Are you embarrassed right now? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's great. What are Listen, we talking you, about? I mean, your wife's doing better than most wives. I mean, I, I don't I don't have any balloons in my house right now. I mean, I, you know, she nothing. just put everyone on notice. I got no color in here. Look at this. Incredible. What were we talking? I don't know what we're talking about. We're talking about about Rory. We're talking about Rory McIlroy, I think. We were talking about, yeah, and look, when he believes something, I think he goes hard after it, and uh, obviously that that works well for him, but maybe, you know, it doesn't at times. Yeah, he's, like I said, I think he's done a a good job uh, with the tour and everything over the last couple of years, and um, yeah, I'm sure when everything irons itself out, he'll be one of the guys that gets the credit for doing it. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about the Ryder Cup uh, in terms of setup and kind of the rules around the setup because we talked a lot about it feels like um, when we we had uh, Eduardo Molinari, Molinari on here and he was going through all of the, the I data. I listened to that and, podcast, yeah. Oh, he was incredible. And it made us realize, and I know that, you know, the the U.S., we try to do the same thing over here. And if you look at the records, it's clearly a big advantage. But after that show, we were like, holy shit, it is such an advantage to be the host team and be able to set up literally the first hole to the point where it's like if your guys, you know, if you know that winning the first hole leads to at least winning a match 65% of the time, and these guys draw the ball, so we're going to make it a cut tee shot. You know, like all of that throughout the entire uh, event multiplied by, you know, three days over 18 holes. And it's just a big, big advantage. Do you think at some point the Ryder Cup should get to a point where it's a neutral party or group that is sort of setting up the golf course? Maybe, but I, I actually think uh, obviously course setup has a little bit of a point to part to play in it. But like, at the end of the day, it's 24 of the best golfers in the world going head-to-head with each other. I think whoever plays the best wins. And I think home advantage, more so than course setup, I think has a big part to play in it. I think, uh, you know, having played a home Ryder Cup and having played an away Ryder Cup, like the home Ryder Cup, so much easier to play. Um, because you've got 50,000 people cheering for you instead of 50,000 cheering against you. And it's just um, that little bit more difficult. I think it'll be interesting to see how the Americans set up bet page because obviously... Beth Page is historically is set up really hard with thick rough like like the Europeans would like to set it up. Um but will the Americans cut cut the rough back and make it wide open like they did with like Valhalla or something like that? I think they probably will. But um yeah, like remember Rory said in the press conference afterwards, I think one of the biggest achievements in golf at the minute could be trying to win it away or either cup and uh, all that has a part to play in it. But I think home advantage, just the the crowd on your back, I think. Uh, has the biggest part to play out of everything. Are you scared of of Beth Page and the fans and what's going to go down? Because Frankie is a is a Long Island institution and he grew up 15 minutes from Beth Page and he can speak to got sort there. of the attitude of the folks in that in that area. Married Beth Page Black in that part yeah. of the world. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, I think if we embrace it, like we as in Europeans, I think whoever's on the team, the 12 guys are on the team, and the people involved. I think if if you try and embrace it as much as you can. Um, I think it'll be okay, but obviously it will be. It'll be, it'll be waste management times a few times. I think um, heckling wise and stuff like that. Um, but I, I think if you prepare right for it, I think you'd be okay. I think if you go there with a with a thought that you know things 
are going to be okay. Uh, I think you're you're kind of going down the wrong route. But if you go go there thinking that it's going to be horrendous on your part, like as a European going there, I think you know to deal with whatever comes your way, I think you'll be okay. Are things going to be okay, Frankie? You think at Beth Page? You know, it's it's going to be a time for sure. I mean, you know, the difference between European fans and like New York fans is, I feel like we're just a little bit less. Um, maybe it's like educated in the game. We just like scream at sports, for regardless of anything, right? You see it in every single sport we have, and I know, and I always bring it back to hockey. But a lot of Canadian fans are always like anti New York fans because like we really don't know what's going on the way they do, like uh, in the game. So we'll just start just screaming shoot. about anything. We just, scream and we just shoot want to get like game. loud. We want to get loud. And we want to get rowdy, and we really don't have any idea. You see, there the waste management too. It's like it's not a specific golf group that's going there. It's like a a rowdy group that's going there. So it should get it should get pretty chaotic. Um, I will say though, um, I'm a big fan of Shane Lowry. So at my yeah, at Borelli's, the Italian restaurant that's right by that page, I will serve Guinness that week okay. for you only. Yeah. If you want to show up the week, if you want to show up the week of the Ryder Cup and have a, and have a pint. I will I will have that gladly for you. Not for any of the Irish fans, though they have they have to drink a Peroni. But for Shane Lowry, if you're looking for a spot to get away, Borelli's is your spot. If I'm not playing, I will. <laughs> okay. <exactly. laughs> also, I I do think there, there's a lot of Irish people in in New York. There's a lot of Irish oh, and yeah. Europeans yeah. in New York. So I think we also the Europeans we need to try and get as many tickets to them as we can. Um, it's gonna be crazy, man. It's just with the with the landscape of golf by that time. Who knows where all of like the bad blood's gonna be and where like live and PGA tour and what players are gonna be in it. It's just like that's that feels like it's a boiling point of golf. That Ryder Cup, like the leading to it, wow. That's it's gonna be the biggest thing in the in, in golf. It's gonna be the biggest thing ever. Well, I think Rory said, didn't he say that he they gotta rewrite the rules because of the ROM jump? He's like, ROM's gotta be in it. But then last week, Luke Donald was in the press center at Phoenix Open saying that they don't have to rewrite the rules because he still has his membership. And I think it's the same thing with Tyrrell Hatton. I think it's only the guys who who gave away their European Tour membership sort of out of spite and because they didn't want to pay the fines, like Sergio and Poulter, those guys who are not eligible. But I think Rom and Hatton are still eligible. Yeah, there, like there was there was certain guys last year. I think Thomas Peters still could have made the team if he had played good enough. So as long as Terrell and John play good enough in the majors and good enough when they're playing, I think uh, they'll definitely be, you know, in line for a pick. Um, obviously, they're two great players and have been great European players. So um, I don't see why not. Um, yeah, we'll just have to see. But look, that's 18 months away. Who knows what's going to happen between now and then? Like, it's who knows? I, I actually, you know, the way golf has been over the last two years, I try not, not to even comment on that anymore because you don't know what's going to happen. Like, you know, the guys behind the closed doors, I don't even think they know what's going to happen yet. Right. I, yeah, makes the most uh, sense. How did your guys, uh, like, Ryder Cup group text respond when someone like John Rahm, like, goes to live? Or you guys go dormant? Or you guys like, congrats? Or, like, what, what happens on the group text? Yeah, it was, uh, rumors were big at the time, and we were all talking about it individually. Um and then John put a message into the group telling us, and yeah, some guys are like, whatever, I was, you know, I was like, whatever, that's your choice, just don't go there and kind of shit on the tours like some people did, uh, you know, go there and go gracefully and, and do what you have to do, and um, Terrell the same, I was disappointed to see them going, because, you know, it's kind of weird that you're not going to play a tournament with John or Terrell until the, until the Masters, so it's, it's, it's a strange kind of it's a strange time in golf, so um, yeah, you know, it, it, as long as as long as guys go and they go gracefully and don't turn around and tell everyone how bad the PGA Tour is and how bad the European Tour is because they're not, you know what I mean? They're they're still great tours, and we we do very well at professional golf. Uh, I'm fine with it. Well, I'm not fine with it. I wish they wouldn't go, but like you know, it is what it is. They're, they're so choice. you said that you you put a message back in the group chat like that, or you, was this an individual thing where you like told him to do a group? I'm just like, do you like that message? Do you do you downvote that message when he says he's going? You don't like the message, obviously, but you just say yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's like it's, it's your choice. You 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 do what you have to do. You Imagine like Tyrrell lo- Tyrrell hearts the message, and everyone's like, he's going, he's next. Like, <laughs> the <laughs> dynamics of professional golf golf group chats might be the most interesting thing I've ever heard about. We had the thing last week, and it's like. How do you respond to these things? I don't, you know, it really, people are leaving group chats and stuff. I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> yeah. It's wild. 
Shane's like, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> no, like, oh, yeah, I, it's a very done with this thing. It's it's fair. It's a personal. It's a very. I personal mean, it's been thing, two. So. It's been years of this now, where it's like these guys. Like, I mean, I wouldn't talk about it either. It's like it the is thing what is, it is. It's hap. Yeah, and the, but the thing is, like leaving group chats and talking about it, and players having a big input. To be honest, right? In my opinion, if if I was clever enough to run a multi-billion-dollar organization like the PGA Tour, I probably wouldn't be playing golf. So I'm not, you know what I mean? These guys, I think, I, I don't think players, I personally don't think players should have as big a say as maybe they are having at the minute, but that's just the way it is. Yeah, I, I like I appreciate you saying that. Because, we, yeah, we don't hear yeah, that perspective very often. I feel like you often. hear the other way. I mean, right. like, and, like these, these businessmen that are trying to do Oh, we're very lucky now to have like people like SSG, all these guys who are like running multi-billion dollar organizations that are coming into golf. I think we should just let them do what they have to do now and run run the organization and, and we will arrive and play tournaments and hopefully great tournaments. To Dan's point, I don't think we've heard that perspective, especially from players really at all or very often. Instead, we kind of hear, you know, the players should have this say and they're independent contractors and the tour is made up. But in reality... Like you said, it's like the, the the experts and people that have, like, think about how much of an advantage that that you have because you have practiced and played golf at such a high level for such a long period of time. You could, it's the same argument for these guys that are that are in theory brought in that have turned franchises around in the Premier League or in the NFL or in the NHL or whatever that have run not only those sports organizations, but other organizations that got them in a position to own and operate and run sports entities that if they then come in and run professional golf in a way better way than it was being run before and they bring things together, then if the tour product is bigger um, and a better product, you guys are going to benefit from that and make more money in the same way that, you know, for us, again, we're Americans like NFL quarterbacks now are making 50 million dollars a year versus 25 30 years ago they simply weren't because the league has gotten so dominant and been run so well and nfl is king here in the u.s that even if the if the tour tour you know combined with pif whatever it turns out to be nuco you know turns into an operation that is 20 50 100 200 percent better than it was before this all started, you guys are all going to have a much bigger pie to share. Yeah, and like I don't think the players should have no say. I think they should have a small say, but I don't think they should have majority say. I think you know these businessmen know what they're doing and they know how to spend money and they know how to use their money wisely. And I think uh, our job is to play golf. Our job is not to run the tour. Um, you know, and that's what I and that's what I kept on saying to Rory over the last you know six months or a year. I'm like, Rory, your job is to play golf and try and win tournaments and. Like, to be honest, I'm kind of, like, if you look at his, how well he's played over the last two years, I think that's incredible. That's even better um, throughout right. the whole thing. Like, even you remember, remember the Canadian Open uh, two years ago where Rory basically, it was like, it was like Rory saving golf coming up the 18th with all the Canadians were coming, were coming behind him and he won the tournament on, I think, something big had happened that week. Um mm -hmm. It was the first live event. The first live event was that week. I think, yeah, I think and that's, you know, stuff like that. He he won certain tournaments at certain times that were, like, huge for the, for the tour as well. So, Shane, I was going to say, um, I'm going to Ireland for the first time in my life, bringing my parents in May. And, you know, I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot about the culture and, and, you know, do a lot of history and tours and stuff. But what is it about the Irish culture that is, like, when you go there, everyone's telling me, wait until you get to the bar scenes, the live music, the drinking aspect, like, you walk in, you're going to have a Guinness in front of you. Like, like what, what, what is it about? I feel like I've traveled. We've, we've been lucky enough to travel around enough where it's like, all right, you kind of know what you're going to get into. I feel like when I'm going to Ireland, like the, the, the expectations have been insane. People are like, this is, you're not going to believe this place. Well, first of all, you're going in May. So that's like not a great, great idea because the weather could be awful. But, um, okay, no, yep. I think okay. honestly, I, I'm obviously, I'm a, Cancel, cancel. Yeah, I'm obviously biased. Gonna handle that great. <laughs> I honestly think it's the people. Uh, I th when you go there, you know, you go into like your local bars. It's the barmen. It's the people working there. Um, look, I think the hospitality in America is great, but I think the people in the hospitality uh, sector in Ireland is what makes it. So, just bring your waterproof. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know <laughs> I always have bad. I have I have the worst luck when it comes to weather. Anyway, we're going to the Daytona 500 on Sunday. It's going to rain the entire day, so it's like I just bring the rain regardless. So if, if whatever month I went, it was going to rain no no matter what. So that part I really wouldn't stress about too much. What's your What's your Mount Rushmore of Irish golf courses? What are the What, what would be your top four? Oh me, top four. Um, well, obviously I'm going to have to have Port Rush in there. Uh, so we're including Northern Ireland. It's all just one thing. Or do you want to? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's want a political to say, statement. I, I just didn't know if you wanted to make that political statement, but it's you know that is well, a political uh, statement. Golf in Ireland is all one country, so. Well, if you want to go, like um, Port Marnock is my is probably my favorite, uh, and then you go down south, you've got. See, I, I find it hard to get four. Um, Waterville and Tralee. Tralee, yeah, heard good things about that place. Tralee is yeah incredible, yeah. What's the golf course here in America that most reminds you of home that you feel the most comfortable at? Is there any? Not really, no. I can't remember. That's I can't, so. Can't TBC think of anything. That, I, I, that, is <laughs> yeah, that is so <laughs> incredible, right? Because you have this whole, you have, a, you have a bunch of golfers from this part of the world that play on it, like mostly just golf courses that are foreign to the way that they grew up playing the sport. Nothing yeah, really like we, we, we do close have, uh, to what you're used to. Yeah, but we have a, we have some parkland courses back home that are pretty good, but they don't they don't really. I got that log off in Florida. Um, I'd love to go out to like Bandon Dunes and see what it's like out there. See if oh. that that will compare at all. But I've never been. Are you interested in that part of like the golf world where these resorts, a place like Bandon, a place like guys like we went to Bandon, it's incredible. Like I've you know we've talked to other players where they they play enough golf and they're like. You know, when I'm done, I'm done. Are you interested, like, on your downtime, going to places like that? Oh yeah, no, I, I, um, I like playing social golf. I like playing golf with my friends and playing golf with like anyone of any handicap or whatever. Um, as long as it, you can have a good time, I, I'm happy. I'm, I'll be there. It's funny. We always say that, like, as just like golf podcasters, we get to actually play some of the cooler golf courses than the PGA Tour guys. Like on a given week. We could go play Bandon or Cabot or whatever, and you guys are kind of strictly just playing these. Yeah, I mean, we play the same incredible. courses every year as well. We right, very right, rarely, right. Go, very rarely go to different courses. It's like the same courses, and it's the same thing every year. It's the same. I mean, you get to the golf course and you know the four pin positions when you're there on Tuesday. It's uh, you know what I mean. You play the same same course every year. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That would get a little monotonous, I guess. Uh, are you uh, Are you ready for the kind of the the homecoming that you're going to have um next year at port rush yeah it's coming around quick um obviously 2019 doesn't feel like that long ago although it is nearly five years um it's uh yeah i'll um i actually haven't been back to port rush since since the open of 2019 which is strange but uh um, i'm gonna try and get up this year when i'm back in the summer before the open maybe for a couple of games uh but yeah, I'm, I'm I'll be excited for that one. Hopefully, I can put in a similar performance uh, and try and win by seven this time instead of six. Yeah, winning by six is just domination, man. Absolute domination. I got lucky. <laughs> no, I played. Look, it was one of those weeks where uh, very fortunate. It, you know, to have your best week of your career that week is just you can't really. He couldn't script it any better than that. It's like something out of a movie. Is there any story to that where, like, maybe you felt like shit on Tuesday or Wednesday, oh, yeah. or did you feel? Yeah, yeah. I had, a, I had a proper. I was called it like a major meltdown. We all we all have them. Like on the Wednesday, Wednesday before, uh, the weather was pretty iffy, and we were. I was out playing a practice round. I think I was playing with G Mac. Someone else. I don't remember who else. Maybe James Suger. He's an amateur. Um, but we were playing and I had the biggest meltdown ever. I hit a few bad shots and I was like, oh my God, I can't do this. <laughs> and I remember that evening, I, I, um, myself and my coach, Neil, we went to the Bushmills Inn, which is a hotel. I was in the house in Bushmills, but we went to the Bushmills Inn about eight o'clock that evening for a coffee. And we sat there and we had like a chat for an hour and I basically like poured my heart out to him about, you know, how nervous I was, how much I, Oh, you're there, you're in Ireland, all your friends and family are coming up the weekend. You kind of like, you know, what if I let everyone down? That kind of, all that stuff is in your head. And um, yeah, I, I did have a proper meltdown. But then when I, when I look back on it, that was just a bit of a, like a 
you know, it was just something that happens. Uh, but like leading into the tournament, I was playing good golf and I had played good golf kind of for a few months before that. And um, yeah, because even on Thursday, I remember I didn't feel like I played that well and I shot four under in the morning and I was leading leading all day until JB Holmes birdied the last, like laid on that night to take the lead from me. But yeah, you know, I probably didn't realize how good I was actually playing at the time myself, which is not a bad thing. Because sometimes when you feel like you're playing really well, you can get complacent and and it can be to your detriment. So, uh, yeah. That's wild that you can bounce back from something. I mean, what like did Rory, Rory made like nervous. an eight on the first hole at Portrush, Yeah, I think he made no? a quad on the first hole. Yeah, he hit an OB. He did, yeah. I remember I remember being on the course for that. I remember like we're on like the whatever hole I started like an hour or two before him. I remember it popped up on one of the screens on the score and it was like Rory McIlroy made an eight on the first hole. I'm like, oh my God, my heart just sunk from I remember him telling me that this is the biggest tournament he was ever going to play and stuff like that. And he obviously built it up a lot on head and to start off like that. And obviously he made that unbelievable run in the second round, which was cool. But yeah, oh, we were we were pulling for Rory so hard at St Andrews also, and just like that that Sunday round where it's like he played pretty solid, good golf, but it just was everything was a two putt and everything was middle of the green like you were waiting for that big Rory moment to just it was like yeah and it was almost like it was almost like the the US Open was the same last year where Wyndham came in and he hit that unbelievable three wood of 14 and he had he made a great par on 17 um you know and sometimes you, you play somebody just plays a little bit better than you and beat you by a shot and that's what happened there as well so yeah that type of pressure man going home like that hour and there hadn't been a open there and forever and for you to just kind of roll up there i remember that was that was one of the more emotional sort of finales you walking down the 72nd hole there just the whole scene how much it meant because it i mean a major championship always means a lot but i I don't know that it could mean more to somebody than it looked like it meant to you in in that moment no i always say i've always i've said it since if you're when i finish my career if you're to write down every tournament i've ever played on a piece of paper and pick one that you want to win that was it and like i managed to do it by a few shots and i got, got to enjoy goosebumps. the last couple of, last couple of holes um is incredible i remember even on the saturday evening uh, i had that great finish on saturday i remember saying to my caddy walking off to 17t and like let's try and enjoy this next 20 minutes because who knows if this will ever happen to us again like and um yeah it was it was incredible that's insane that's awesome that's just awesome what a game man what a, what a cool game what an accomplishment how good you have to be at what you do, even just watching you in, in side gig with Dan. It's like, you know, we, we love, the, you know, the the Irish and the Jolly and Shane Lowe and all these fake stories of you getting shit-faced apparently. And it's like, no, this guy is unbelievably good at his craft and what he does and a major champion in the biggest tournament that you'll ever play in in your life. And, and you know, showing up at the Ryder Cup uh, last year and just delivering in huge moments is just... Uh, as a, the guys that play this game, you know, on the weekend, now we found ourselves in times where we're on camera, we've got big moments and how pretty much impossible it is to hit good golf shots in big moments when you're nervous for someone to have done I it. Did, I did, yeah. I, I, I did watch you last Wednesday night. I watched a bit of you last Wednesday night, so. Um, oh, what do you uh, think? What do so, you think? Yeah, second, big moments. Solo second in the Desert Open. Solo second right here in the Desert Open. <laughs> what, what, what clips did you see? What did you think? Uh, I watched about 20 minutes, so I was in bed, and I was just kind of flicked it on, um, and uh, yeah, it was it was cool, wasn't it? It was something different, um, and it looked cool, and who, Dan, did you play with Will Wilcox? Yeah, your Strixon brethren. He, he caddies for Sungjae, I was out with him the first two days as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's he's, guy, yeah. Uh, he's staying at, he's staying at my house this week, he okay. is a beauty, he's yeah, one of my yeah. favorite people in the world. Yeah, he's a good guy, yeah. So what we'll yeah. do is we'll we'll keep track and tabs of if these tournaments deny your letters, and then we'll come down there and play you in a match. Then we'll, we'll, whatever week that you're off, then you'll it's, have the four points to, to keep me. the competition up. That's <laughs> great to me. You know, because I mean, th- I mean, they're not going to keep doing it. But if if the PJ Tour doesn't freaking get our guy Shane Larry into these things, we got to get we got to get the matches going. We're coming down keep there. Com- yeah. Oh my god, we coming down there. That'd be a fun one. Um. All right. It sounds like you have as a hell of a Dan, Valentine's Day. As long as Dan caddies for me. Yeah. As long as Dan yeah. carries for you, well, that's what we do, right? Like, because we've played so many guys at this point, and Dan is just simply too good. And like, we make this argument all the time, where it's like him at like, him being a part of our group 
just didn't make it really competitive where it was four of you won. So now he's in the cart with you guys and it's oh, really? become way more competitive. We're getting like waxed now. I mean, like <laughs> Sam Burns beat us like four, like five oh. and four. It like, wasn't even close. Yeah, he so. curb stopped um, us. It was tough. It was tough. So, yeah. So we'll see how we do against you we'll in the first it. nine. Maybe we'll add Dan to come in and, and substitute him, but we'll see. All right, Shane. Uh, we appreciate it. We appreciate the time. Uh, good luck the rest of this year. Hopefully you're playing in every event. You don't have to play against us, but if you're not, then we would obviously love to do that. Yeah, and, exactly. uh, and have a have a great Valentine's Day. Like I said, it looks like you're in. Yeah, for, enjoy uh, that balloon, help. my friend. You got to be in the mood now. You got a personalized <laughs> balloon. <laughs> Go on, thanks, guys. Uh, thank you, Shane. Take care. <laughs> thank bye, you, Shane. bye.